Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the next in our series of Grand Challenge lectures hosted by the Institute for Liberal Arts and Sciences. My name is Jonathan Wassling. I'm Pro Vice Chancellor and Dean of Natural Sciences, but I'm also Director of the Institute for Liberal Arts and Sciences. And thank you very much for uh, coming this evening. I know we've got a lot to look forward to a really exciting uh, lecture. The format is as normal. Um, our host, uh, our um, guest lecturer is going to speak for 40, 45 minutes, and there's plenty of time for discussion and interaction, um, uh, both formally with questions afterwards, but also amongst yourselves um, uh, later. And the Nesfield Bar is open later on as well, if you want to migrate to there to uh, lubricate your thoughts and uh, become more expansive in your discussions uh, for, for, for a while. Uh, but without further ado, it's my, my great pleasure to welcome Tim Lang, who is our, our guest lecturer this evening. Uh, he's uh, warned me about um, uh, uh, giving a very long and lugubrious introduction to his CV and said he might heckle at some point if, uh, well, if, if I... <laughs> I will, if you permit me, though, uh, Tim, just say one or two things just about, about your background. Um, uh, Tim is a professor of food policy at City University in London, uh, where he founded the Centre for Food Policy in 1994, um, which he subsequently made, uh, uh, led for, for many years. Um, professor Lang became interested in food policy following, it says here, a period of working as a hill farmer in Lancashire during the 1970s. And anybody who knows Lancashire, anything about hill farming and the sort of weather that you might get up there, I imagine there was plenty of time for reflection in um, quite tough terrain with probably not the most, um, the, the most forgiving climate around you and, and presumably at some stage doing your thoughts um, and your communing with your, 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 your hill farming there, uh, you, uh, you began to become particularly interested about food and about food policy and I think that tells us a lot about his uh, Tim's uh, future career. Uh, so he then went on, uh, you started I believe in, in a, 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 um, a PhD in social psychology but soon uh, saw the light, no sorry, apologies to social psychologists, but soon saw that that could be applied. <laughs> soon saw that, I, I have a, a school of, uh, of psychology in my faculty so I'm actually on extremely dangerous ground yes, here so I shall re <laughs> recant on that statement immediately but soon saw that, uh, that applying some of the things that you learned there that there was a real interest in a growing interest in the, the interconnected challenges we have in the food system along areas of health, social justice and, and citizenship. And so Tim is currently working on sustainable uh, uh, food systems, the meaning of the modern food, food, food system and the implications of, of Brexit for uh, the, 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 the food system. Uh, Tim is, is well known nationally and internationally and I shan't embarrass him by reading out a whole range of um, his, his international connections, but he has worked very actively on food policy in a variety of former, uh, fora, including international organisation, organisations such as the World Health Organisation, um, the FAO and the UN Environment Programme, um, and he helped launch the 100 World Cities Urban Food Policy Pact at Milan in 2015. Nationally, he served uh, as a special advisor for the House of Commons Select Committee inquiries. He was commissioner on the UK's gov government's Sustainable Development Commission, review, review, reviewing progress on food sustainability, and he was on the Council of Food Policy Advisors to the Department or to, to, to DEFRA. Uh, he works very closely uh, with the scientific community and also uh, civil society and has reigned, uh, also published a large range of books, um, including Food Wars um, and un Unmanageable Consumer, uh, uh, The Unmanageable Consumer and Ecological Public Health, and a variety of other books, which I'm sure are available at all good booksellers. <laughs> no. Um, no, no. Very boring. Indeed. Very boring. <laughs> um, we may stop them in Black Rolls here. We'll have to go and check. Well, later. that sounds very boring. Um, uh, he obviously writes frequently for the media, um, and uh, but I would say the final footnote is he clearly maintains his interest uh, in in farming. Um, 
according to your biography, you, you grow fruit and, and vegetables still in London, mm -hmm. but we've just been chatting about your, your future interest in expanding the size of your allotment <laughs> to something a little bit bigger uh, as you go back to, to your, your roots in farming. Um, and so we look forward to hearing um, maybe a little bit about that, but I think particularly around the title of our lecture this evening, a really uh, I important one for all of us. I assume the question is rhetorical, but we'll wait and see. But is the UK food uh, is or UK food is it secure? So, welcome this evening, yeah. Professor Tim Lang. Thanks, Jonathan, very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Jonathan. That was very nice. And forgive me heckling. Um, it's one of the worst things about getting old is having introductions uh, about you. It's like seeing your life pass in front of you. Um, I realised I didn't take a quotation mark off at the front, but these are the two questions I'm really asking. Um, I actually do want to ask Jonathan because I think it's um, important. Here we are, we've just voted, and here we are in the environs of Stoke, the highest vote for leaving. And uh, Britain gets 30% of its food from the European Union and another 11% through trade deals negotiated as a member of the European Union. So where are we going to get this food from on January the 1st, 2021? You know, it's not just a theoretical issue. Um, but the, the big question, why when you kindly asked me to come and do this, uh, well, there were two reasons in my mind very quickly. One was because I think it's actually an issue of public interest and I think we've got to start discussing it again. We haven't done it because we've been compliant members of the European Union. Actually, we don't know we've been born, frankly. Uh, uh, but the other reason is I've spent the last year and a half writing another very big and boring book, um, which is out next month. Uh, which is about UK food security, and it's called Feeding Britain. So tonight I'm actually going to run through a tiny bit of some of the big thinking um, in that book, because, you know, books you can... You're talking to yourself in a study, and, um, and then Penguin editors read it, and it's gone out in peer reviews and all sorts of things, but I'm more interested in, in looking at your reaction, actually. So I can see you. You'll find me watching you. So I want to know what you're interested in and what doesn't fly with you and what does. So let's, I always do too many slides, let me just tell you. I think I've done 45 slides and I've probably used three minutes of my 45 minutes. I go fast, but they're for you, so you can have them afterwards, okay? If you're very nice to me only. Um, this is, some of them are complicated, so I tend to do rings around them. Can you see, you, there's a screen over there and the screen here. But basically, if, if we'll come to what do we mean by food security. This is the term that we use these days. But the Economist Intelligence Unit, which is a very boring bunch of economists, has for the last um, um, 10 years done a pretty conventional index of food security around the world. It rates the UK as 17th out of 113 countries. In economic terms, we're the fifth richest economy, and already we're down to 17th in food security. If over here uh, uh, they add in sustainability criteria to the three criteria they've looked in the past, uh, affordability, availability, and quality and safety, Jonathan, you and I would be unhappy. They put quality and safety together. I think that you can have high quality food, but it's not safe. Um, but when they start adding sustainability, Britain plummets. It goes down to 24th of 67 countries. Uh, okay, they, in the main food security index, they measured 113 countries, only 67 because not all countries have good data on their environmental aspects. So in other words, already, dear audience, Britain's looking slightly interesting, rich, but not food secure, and getting worse when it's more sustainability. For you plant insect people, you don't need to be told this. So here are my questions. I will give you data on Britain not feeding itself. Jonathan Wasling has already told you that, but I'll give you some figures. My question is, does it matter? Let me tell you, in my book, I lance someone that I've been waiting to lance intellectually for a long time in the cabinet, who will be nameless, but one day his name will be revealed, uh, but not now. 
um, and not in my book, who said, it doesn't matter if we don't feed ourselves, we're rich, we can always buy on world markets. Now, I want to unpick that because that basically means, let me put it in another way, it's an imperialist position. You're saying other people feed you. This is very British. We are the only country in the world that has that as a default policy. Second question, I think it does, what some people say, no, it doesn't matter, we're rich, we can buy. Others say, yes, it does matter, it's food imperialism, everywhere's got to look after their land or sustainability issues, where if you're buying food from other people's land, it may not be so good when climate change kicks in. Okay, so an interesting debate. Second question, are there opportunities to change this? I'm a policy analyst. I'm interested uh, not in farming or not in doing high technology development. I'm interested in the decision making about that. Who is going to take control of this? Who, if anyone, is going to be interested in this? Some people say, well, the chances of changing it, the British like to eat what they like. It takes a long time to change diets. Lydia Martin's here, and I know that. It takes a very long time to change diets, but British diet has changed dramatically in the last 70 years. But on climate change terms, we're going to have to change our diet in 30 years. Actually, arguably, 12. We're going to have to do some very drastic dietary change. Dietary change is slow. Others say, actually, it'll just be an oil crisis, or as Jonathan and I were just talking about, you know, do we become, does Mr. Johnson make us the 52nd or 51st state of the US? Will there be a war? The Middle East could spill over very easily, by the way. Uh, or could there be zoonoses? Could this coronavirus be a harbinger of things? OK, so those are my questions. Now I'm going to go very fast. Where does our food come from? This is one of my favorite things in my book. Uh, this is a world map from 1940. This is actually from the Ministry of Food's secret files uh, in the war, uh, uh, in the Second World War. Um, uh, when Lord Walton, who my mother worked for in Liverpool when he ran Lewis's of Liverpool, the big department store in the 30s, uh, he was plucked by Churchill to become the new Minister of Food and to kick out the previous person who was doing very little. And he got the map. He wanted a map. He said, where does the food come from? This is the map, and he had it above his desk. Okay, just to remind him how Britain basically only fed itself 30% in 1939. By 1945, it fed 66% of its own diet. So it had to do a massive investment in labor, control, land use, you name it. And it was because of this map, basically. Where does it come from now? Uh, well, you can't see this. This is 1998. This is 2016. This is from uh, the recent... Um, DEFRA, the Department of Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, from uh, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs figures and Office of National Statistics. Basically, you can't really see it, but the amount of food is dropping steadily. There was a high point in the early 1980s when Britain was about 80% self-sufficient at a time when Mr. Johnson was cutting his journalistic teeth and attacking Britain for bent bananas and the craziness of Brussels. Actually, Britain was getting a very good deal. It was beginning to feed itself at about an 80% level, which I think is about what one could aim for with a climate like Britain. Uh, where we get it from, uh, this is uh, one of the many figures. Actually, there are very different ways for we academics. There are different ways of calculating. Do you calculate f food self-sufficiency or supplies by value, by tonnage, by nutrient value, so on? There are, there's no real clarity about it, actually. One of the things I was irritated with the Cameron government was it stopped our development of new indicators of food security. So we're left with just their figures, not good figures. But look at it, 50%, we get 30% from the European Union, we get 4% from Africa, America, South America, Asia, the rest of Europe, 2%, Australasia, 1%. You meet people in the current cabinet who somehow think we're going to resurrect the empire and get 
uh, Australasia, a bit of uh, uh, Asia, and a bit of Latin America to feed us. Uh, this is very interesting politics. It's cloud cuckoo land. Uh, here's where the flow of lorries comes in. If any of you have read the leaked Yellow Hammer papers, I had a little part in helping build the pressure for that to be leaked. I didn't leak them, I can assure you. Uh, but um, I wrote a paper in The Lancet, basically, which Richard Horton pushed through uh, within a week, basically saying, uh, essentially, look, at this is where, you know, for two places that food comes into, it's Dover and the Channel Tunnel. That's actually where about 90% of the food comes in. And it comes in either by lorry or ship. Okay? Go back to Lord Wilton, it was all by ship. Okay? So now, just think food defense terms, uh, you're talking about two means. Very little food comes in by air, by the way. A certain amount, high value added, but not much. And here's where it comes from. We start looking... Uh, you, know, you start breaking it down by different countries and it gets more interesting. These are containerized port, um, imports. Uh, essentially, in these ports, so Harwich here, or in the port of London in there, vast container ships come in to the now sold off. We don't even own our ports. They've all been sold off, by the way, uh, except one. Um, uh, they come in in containers. So, whoops, sorry. They come in in containers. And that's what those figures are. Different things come in in different routes into containers and then onto lorries. So, whether it's by ship or by lorry under the Channel Tunnel, it always ends up on a lorry. Okay, so just think about that. Uh, people like me worry about this. It's that the, what we call in my world the tr food trade gap. This is 1993, and this is a year and a half ago, the provisional figures, but they'll be pretty right. Basically, the imports are rising faster than the exports. For 35 years, the British governments, of all politics, have had the same policy, which is just to pay for imports by selling more exports. In public health terms, what that means is we're importing fruit and vegetables, the good stuff for health, and we're selling heart disease to everyone else. That's actually what is happening. I'll show you here. Uh, if you want to look at this later, you can see these are actually fruit and veg, meat, beverages, cereals, dairy, fish, miscellaneous things. That's sort of basically ultra-processed foods. Coffee, tea, animal feed, oils, fats, oils, sugar, and preps. Okay, this is just in one slide that I could get it on. There's only one of these columns which is in the black, and that's beverages, and that's because of whiskey. Basically, we export whiskey. Uh, whiskey's quite nice, but, you know, I think it's quite interesting that we don't have a horticultural industry anymore in a significant way, except for strawberries. Put it in a different way, uh, this is just literally, look at the orange colour, that's the food from Europe. This side of this diagram is the imports, that side is the exports. We're basically getting vast amounts from the EU, and we've just left it. Why does this matter? Let's get now intellectual. Here's where me as a policy, uh, I as a policy person start having to be very boring. I've been talking about different notions. I've introduced the notion of food self-sufficiency. I've introduced the notion of food defense. Now, I'm actually increasingly in my book, a huge slab of the book is about how can we protect our supply lines? Literally, forget Tesco does it for you. Tesco can be taken out by five bombs in three RDCs. Okay? A study was done for the military by, for, and for the state in the mid-2000s that said, don't worry, it'll all, it can resurrect. If one of these RDCs is taken out, the others can fill the gaps. Uh, I'm going back to basics, and I'm doing a Lord Walton or a John Boydor or a Beveridge, uh, anyone who knows their history, 
Sir William Beveridge was the chief civil servant in the Ministry of Food in World War I, was brought back to do the official history, and was brought back in 1936 to do a review in case there was another war. And in my book, I'm arguing we need another. This is exactly when we need another. And actually, very interestingly, uh, there is a process beginning in Whitehall at the moment under Henry Dimbleby, a fast food entrepreneur, called the National Food Strategy. This is going to be needing to be watched. I talk with him. I think he's a good man. I think he's on our collective side. But I think it's really interesting, Jonathan. I look at you as a research manager. Make sure you invite Jonathan Dimbleby to do one of these talks. Invite him and be very nice to him and say, more, 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 please. Okay? Henry Dimbleby, the son of the famous ones. Uh, are you reading the slide? So I've stressed food to friends. Beveridge used this term, food control. You have a state which has to say, well, we'll ration. When things are hard, we ration. We ought to be rationing meat now already, actually. We really should be, for all sorts of reasons. There are all these different terms which I unpick in my book, but I'm really tonight just talking with you about self-sufficiency, defense, and control, and particularly this, resilience. A good food system is one that can bounce back when there's a shock. That's in ecological terms is the notion of resilience. Can it bounce back? Can a population of insects bounce back after a bad time? Can it bounce back? Is it sufficiently strong to be able to do that? And we use that very same metaphor and argument in uh, food supply systems. Uh, I said this. Essentially, my argument is that a food resilient system for the 21st century, what we should be aiming for in Britain or anywhere, I give this same slide to any talk I do in the world, is we need to be thinking about health, how many nutrients are we getting per acre, not what's the profitability, but how many nutrients, what's the nutrient count, what's social values, the quality, because it matters, people only like to eat what they like to eat, uh, the environmental impacts, which are very complicated. It's not just carbon, it's water, it's soil, it's amenity, it's biodiversity. Uh, it's also the governance, the decision-making. We know people riot if they don't trust food. They riot. Tesco had a riot two years ago, not publicized, a huge riot in its supermarkets in the southwest of England over some shortages of just two vegetables. They were astonished. And the economy. The economy is clearly how much it costs, where it comes from, what are the labor conditions. These are complicated issues. So I'm someone as an academic who argues, if I was beverage, I give this to Henry Dimbleby whenever I talk to him, don't just think tonnage, think what we call in academic terms a multi-criteria approach. Don't lock yourself into one view of security. In one slide, this is the British food system. Actually, half a slide. Can you see it's just a chain? Don't worry. The f whoops, where was it? The food starts down here. Farmers, growers, fishing down here. Fishing is tiny. Up here is us, the consumers. We spent last year £225.7 billion on food and drink. This is government's official figures. Farming, fishing got less than a billion pound of that. Okay? So not even half a percent. Okay? Uh, partly because 40 years ago, British fishing sold its quotas, and now blames Brussels, by the way. But it sold its own quotas. Uh, we are where we are. Uh, this block, retailing, sorry, catering, takes 30% 30, 30 of the value, retailing about the same, food manufacturing about the same. Farming gets 6% of the value of food. So when you go and spend money, just assume about 6% of the value of what you're giving is going to the primary producer. That's astonishing. How can we expect food production to double, which is probably what we need to do, unless we're paying the people who produce it. And I'll show you some figures later. Uh, 
Here are the gross value added figures from the latest chart. I pulled them down literally from the latest data. This is the gross value added, 125 uh, billion out of the 225 billion. Essentially, this for me is the most important slide from my book I'm giving you. I'm basically saying to you as an audience here at Kiel, um, which way do you want Britain to go? Atlanticist, globalist, I call it imperialist, so do you really expect ex-commonwealth countries to feed us again? Mm, some people do. There are big horticultural companies who are moving out of Britain and going to Ghana and Gambia, where they've, you've got longer hours, cheaper labor, cheaper land, but longer routes, R-O-U-T-E-S. Outer European, why bother with citrus fruit from Spain when you can get it from Morocco or Tunisia? Some of the same firms are moving from Spain to Tunisia. Actually, sometimes it's the same labor, but they pay them less. Uh, a reformed Europe, a lot of people argue, well, within 10 years, we'll be back in a European, reformed European. Or Macron, President Macron is talking about a, a two-tier Europe. It's possible, who knows. Uh, nationalist, do you really want to just be UK first, autarkic? Pretty difficult, actually. Or actually, where most people in Whitehall sit, they're not interested at all. I think our problem is we've, we've got too many people disinterested, uh, and some, the conoscenti, see, there's a fight in the cabinet at the moment between Atlanticist, globalist, and imperialist. That's the fight at the moment in the British cabinet. If we talk land... Uh, this is from a very brilliant study, well, eight years of studies by the Centre for Alternative Technology at its, its higher education institute at Machanlath in Mid Wales. Uh, in diagrammatic form, this is British land, what it's used for. Growing food for us is this orange stuff here, and in yellow here is the food land use for growing feed for animals. Uh, the pink is grassland for livestock, so basically this is all animals. If we really wanted to be zero carbon, which the government is committed to, it says we are, but no one's really pushing us very far on that route, we would have to, whoops, my circle has dropped, we'd have to double, look at the orange here, it's gone from that amount to this amount. We're going to have to radically change land use, radically, and eat differently as a result. The good news, by the way, is public health improves. That's the good news. Uh, now, I want to talk about food defence. Why defence matters? Well, it's why we joined the common market. Actually, it's partly why the common market was set up. We've left it. But out in the real world, prices are volatile, very volatile. After 40 years of stability, I could show you graphs where the prices are going like spaghetti. No one quite understands. Now that, when you, I've just told you, farming gets 5 to 6% of the value added of what we as consumers spend out there in the world markets that some people say, don't worry, we'll buy on world markets. It's actually not as easy as we think. Britain, let me just tell you, is about to become the sixth economy in the world and within three years, the seventh. We're basically being overtaken and we've left where we had some security. So this is becoming, I think, more important, not less important, is the point of my talk. I don't mind that we've left the European Union. I'm just saying, now get real. Uh, here's the figures. <clears throat> Here you can see this is from 1961 to literally last year. These are world prices. They actually steadily came down and then they rocketed and they've gone wobbly. That was the oil crisis in the early 70s. It's oil. Food is oil. Oil moves food. Oil drives food around the motorways. Oil gets you to the supermarket. Oil gets Tesco to deliver it. Oil gets the tractor to drive it. Oil is turned into the pesticides which sprays it and kills the biodiversity. It's oil. But then when you look at different, over here, different uh, commodities, they're operating different ways, but none of them are level. These are world prices. So out there in the world markets, 
It's very messy indeed. And all the big boys, the World Banks, the OECDs, the UNCTADs, who used to say, don't worry, it's all calm and the markets are measured, are now saying volatility is the new norm. So if Britain has left where it wants to be and you'll find the Prime Minister and others saying they want to negotiate on this world market, well, it's, the sea is choppy, is what I'm saying. And uh, that's the wrong analogy. That's what happens if you get Yellowhammer kicking in. That's, uh, the assessments done by the Cabinet Office was that um, there'd be 20-mile tailbacks at Dover within two days of a hard Brexit. And if you notice, hard no deal is now back on the agenda. So it's not gone. And this is what actually is concentrating minds in the Cabinet. Because within three to five days, there are shortages in Tesco. And let me just tell you, Dave Lewis has told the Prime Minister that. Okay. I won't read this out, but this is the Civil Contingencies Act 2004, the key passage. Uh, and it basically says um, uh, we have to do reviews. And this is DEFRA's review, the latest published one, which is 2018. Uh, you can read it later if you want, but let me just tell you it's complacency in black and white. It says everything's perfect. We operate on the just-in-time supply <laughs> chain, has sophisticated logistics. Everyone can r respond rapidly to potential disruption. This is written at the same time as they knew that there would be chaos within two days. Okay? Yet this is the only official document on the web about British food security. Resilience, blah, 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 everything, you know, you can substitute. If you bomb one RDC, you can have food from the, the, another one there within a, a, a day or two. Resilience demonstrated in response to events such as 2015 flooding and disruption, H1N1 pandemics, Jonathan, I'm sure you know this, Icelandic, volcanic, everything's okay, we're rich, we can deal with it. Meanwhile, elsewhere in Whitehall, there is a realisation this is complete and utter nonsense. If we talk real defence, if we want to go over to an Atlanticist model, that means getting food from North America, and that means getting it from the USA, and there's a very strong commitment within the Cabinet to do that. Let me just remind you of the state of the British Navy in 1939. It had uh, basically 500 ships of major proportions. At the moment, we've got 75 and of the par, uh, submarines and of the, 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 the destroyer class, four of any of the 12 in operation are out of action because the engines don't work. Uh, uh, I've put here a comparison of patrol boats. If you wanted to protect um, short supplies on the ship, here's the UK border force. We have 7,721, 20, 23 miles of coastline. Here's Turkey, four and a half thousand, Italy, four and three quarters, Greece, eight and a half, and so on. We have five vessels in the border force. Okay, actually, the good news since this 2017, it's now going up to 12. Um, these are boats which are about from here to the end there. Okay, so they're teeny and tiddly. Last one I visited, they were replenishing themselves by getting their food from Sainsbury's. Um, I'm not too impressed by their resilience. Uh, Croatia has got more boats than us. Okay? The Netherlands has 16. Greece has 240. If you want to protect your supply lines, think about the fees. And this, by the way, you know, is from Defence Journal. This isn't you know, revolutionary socialists or uh, neo-Nazis weekly news or something. This is from very, very boring sources, okay. I talked to rear admirals, and uh, these are serious, tall men, almost all in very large uniforms and with big feet. Uh, when I look at the budgets that are going out, the Ministry of Defence here, are the latest figures that I can get for over 10 years, just on submarines, spending 44 billion. That's half the value of... Um, HS2 currently, and so on. Yeah, this is large amounts of money, OK? So in one year, the MOD's budget was 35.3 billion. Um, DEFRA's budget, anyone guess what DEFRA's budget is? This is the food 
ministry. Anyone like to guess? Come on, audience participation. Ten. Ten, three, two. Here it is. Okay, actually, in 2019 to 20, to be fair, the Tories have increased the budget. It's going up, 39, and then 2020 to 21, 41.3. Uh, so that previous figure was low. In other words, they're putting more money in. DEFRA's in for this current year uh, is 1.9 billion and is going up to a handsome two. I'm not seeing big priorities here. Okay, always follow the money. Now let me just remind you the world situation. The world situation on food is tricky. Um, we've turned the world upside down. There's actually not a shortage of food. There's too much food. So there's an overproduction of food in the world. And you know, this is a famous slide done by my friend Jan Rockström at uh, Stockholm, just trying to put, give the impression, look, lots of things are going on in the world of food, and it's happening fast. Whatever it is you want to look at, there are rapid changes across many, many indicators. And part of the issue is this. On the left-hand side are, are low-income countries, and the middle here are middle-income countries, and we're here high-income. And this is a very interesting set of studies done by people I know in Brazil and now everywhere, in Rio, uh, sorry, in Sao Paulo. <clears throat> this notion of what sort of food are we eating? And in studies, the British are eating the most processed diet of any one in the European Union. Okay, we're not in it anymore. But we eat... 50% of our diet from what is called ultra-processed foods. So that's high in fat, salt, sugar, uh, basically legally adulterated. It looks like food, but it's been whipped up. It maybe doesn't have much contact with original ingredients. Uh, and it tastes nice, and it makes quite a large amount of money for the manufacturers and the retailers. What's happening is the rest of the world is eating more and beginning to follow us. <coughs> Here are the rich countries in blue, ultra-processed diets, eating processed diets and non-alcoholic beverages. We're consuming more and more soft drinks. This is basically a code for the problems of diet turning into public health problems. So you've got to think very basically, what's good for public health when you're thinking about food supplies? That's the point I'm raising. Here's another angle. This is from study that I spent three and a half years of my life that came out exactly a year ago called the Eat Lancet Commission. Uh, the Lancet, the medical journal Lancet takes sort of 15 or 20 people like me, throws them in the room and says, come up with the answer to a problem. And our problem was, uh, can we feed the world sustainably 9 billion people by 2050? And I have to tell you, I thought the answer would be no. The calculation was the answer could be yes if the world eats very differently. And the big proviso was, could we do that by 2050 without wrecking the ecosystems? So that meant having to think very seriously, hence this work, about what's the impact of food on the ecosystems. And this is a very important slide, which you can look at later. These are different foods, ruminant meat, pork, chicken, fish, dairy, eggs, sugar, oils, nuts, roots, soybeans, legumes, vegetables, fruits, cereals. And these are the impacts on greenhouse gases, land use, energy use, acidification potential, and eutrophication. Basically, when you go up here, animals, animals fish, and dairy, and eggs, the impacts start getting very big. When you get down here, fruits, legumes, legumes, roots, vegetables, they're very low, proportionately. And this is one of the central things that's come out of science in the last 30 years. The more we can grow plants and not grow them just to feed to animals, which are very inefficient converters, and not making the farmers any money, the better health gets. And this is saying the better ecosystems are. And you can look after biodiversity with the land that's released. And here in one slide is a summary of that. Food accounts for about 26% <laughs> of all greenhouse gas emissions. 58% of that food impact is from animals. And 50% of that is just down to beef and lamb. 
it doesn't matter which way you look at it, whether you look at methane, this is a famous study done by Ripple and colleagues, uh, just showing you the methane. The methane emissions are massive, absolutely massive. So I, I'm, I'm glad Jonathan introduced me. I was not just a, a farmer, a pedigree Welsh black cattle, black Welsh mountains, swale dells, Tamworth pigs, you know. I've, I've reared and killed them all and eaten them all, and now don't eat them. I think we've got to reduce dramatically. And this is part of the reason land use, Mark Twain famously is said to have said, buy land, they don't make it anymore. Uh, there's no proof he said it, but it's pretty witty. Um, uh, in Brazil, there's a lot of land, four and a half hectares per person. In the European Union, even when we were in it, it's less than one. And what we're growing crops on is the brown stuff. India, 1.2 billion people, there's almost all there's, the land is used for cropland. What we've got to do is grow more forest. And if it's the pastures, the green pastures, which probably we're going to have to rewild and allow more for biodiversity to be carbon sinks. Animals can be carbon sinks. I'll happily discuss this with you. Cows can be useful. The problem is the cow population is just exploded. Anyone tell me where the biggest cattle population in the world is? India. Uh, here's just one issue I have to flag. We talk a lot about carbon and food. I think we've got to talk a lot more about water. We think we're British, we've got lots of water. Let me just tell you, the stre water stress maps of Britain are not as comfortable as one might think. And when you look at them in relation to horticulture, they're definitely not. One moment it's dry, the next moment it's flooded because it's either underwater or close. And Britain is importing other people's water. This is the work, brilliant work done by my guru, Tony Allen, uh, and lovely work here by Tim Hess and Chloe Sutcliffe at Cranfield a couple of years ago. Basically, Britain is importing 13.5 billion kilos of fresh fruit and vegetables a year. That is actually using 560 million cubic meters of fresh water. This is good quality water, potable water, okay? not, not sewage water, it's high drinking quality water. That's 211 kilos of water per person thing. All of this is from, sorry, 74%, from countries with water vulnerabilities. Look at this from India. So we're taking water stressed, we're taking water embedded in food from countries which are themselves water stressed. Uh, you can tell I get slightly moralistic about this. I think, you know, this even, you know, water really in the last 10 years is the thing that has shaken me actually. Um, okay, what does this suggest? How am I doing for time, Jonathan? Am I okay? Is this okay? I'm looking, no one's fallen asleep yet, not quite yet. Uh, am I okay? Okay, now let's, oh, what have I just done? I've closed it. No, I haven't. Okay, I have to do this on this. No, I have to do that. What does this mean? Let me just tell you what the Eat Lancet Commission, which you can read, it's, it's down, free to download, called Food in the Anthropocene and the Lancet last year. So if you just put Eat Lancet Commission into Google, this will come up and you can download the whole lot. Basically, this is global <coughs> thinking that we did. Essentially, what it means is if we want to reduce carbon, improve and protect ecosystems, start thinking about water. Some of the world's best water scientists were on the Lancet Commission. Great honor to be with them. You come up with this. Basically, we don't need to increase cereals. We've just got to stop feeding them to animals. We've got to increase vegetables by 75%. Nuts by 150%, fruits by 50%, red meat we've got to reduce by 65%. Uh, fish increase by 50%, that's tricky, it's almost certainly going to have to be aquaculture. There's an argument we don't need that at all, but people like it. Legumes we've got to increase by 75%. <coughs> this is a radical transformation of land use, totally different messages to farmers. That means around Staffordshire, we need to be thinking, where could we do horticulture that we aren't at the moment? In Cheshire, which in 20 years' time, Jonathan, 
will be very different climate, uh, and so on. So some of this thinking everywhere in the world when the studies are done, it comes up with something like this. Radical <coughs> change in food production. For the UK, this is figures we haven't published yet. This is UK figures I'm giving you. Um, the change is dramatic. We've got to increase uh, uh, legumes and fruits and vegetables by very large amounts indeed. Actually, in the UK, technically, we don't need to produce more nuts and seeds. And I was very surprised by this till I realized that actually most of the seed production is actually in, in this data set, which is FAO data set, is about oilseed rape. Um, uh, my, my cousin Charles, your, your, who's at the back here, our, our shared uh, maternal grandmother was from Kent. Uh, I've done in my book a, a quick review of Kent for, um, for uh, sort of personal reasons. Um, uh, the amount, the collapse of the British nut industry is a very interesting example of what's gone wrong and we've got to put right. How can we rebuild cob nuts and hazelnuts? Why not? What's stopping it at the moment is basically labour. It's a labour problem. Which is why I was saying to your group earlier, Jonathan, you've got to get into the economists with the labour process. All these things are critical to discuss. But the impact of following this sort of dietary transition and, and land transition is fantastic. Let me explain very quickly. At the moment where um, if we just ate, carried on eating what we're eating at the moment, we've got to reduce uh, our, uh, our, our, the impact of our current diet. We can do it a bit. We can tweak it a bit. If we become what's called a flexitarian diet, in other words, quite dramatically cut down our, our um, meat use, uh, it, the impact the improvement, the drop in resource use is very considerable. If we go pescatarian, in other words, we don't eat any meat, but we eat some fish, it drops even more. If we go vegetarian, it's a slight drop. And if we go vegan, it actually drops a lot. Okay? But the water use goes up. That's the vegetables. We've got to think about water use and vegetables. Uh, time and time again, these are the figures that happened. The more we can go from being a high meat-eating diet towards vegetarian or occasional flexitarian or vegan or eating across all of those. I don't eat meat, but I eat fish occasionally. Um, almost all vegetarian, but increasingly have quite a lot of what could be called vegan. The more we go down in this route over time, the better. The resource use improves, health improves, all sorts of things improve. Now I want to talk about money. Uh, I don't know, I should have looked up what <coughs> figures there are on who owns what land in Shropshire, or Staffordshire, or Cheshire. But in England as a whole, Guy Shropshire is the only person who's really taken this seriously recently. Here are the figures of who owns land in England. But what's interesting is over the last 20, 25 years, land values have gone up. This is the figures from um, <coughs> uh, Savills and Andersons uh, from the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors. You can see over time, basically, land has grown in value. Land has become bought for the view, bought as an investment. Um, any of you got a Dyson um, vacuum cleaner? Did you know Tim, uh, not Tim Dyson, he's the geographer, uh, James Dyson has bought 35,000 acres of Lincolnshire? Lincolnshire, yeah. Yeah, I did, because I'm from Lincolnshire. It's very interesting. Massive intake of EU funds, but he was a voter out. Uh, and here's what's interesting. Over the last 1993 to 2019, so this is last year, but the estimates, actually the profit, the income, this is what, it, it, it's DEFRA speak, it's known in my world as the TIF figures, total income from farming. The red line here is the subsidy. So total income is the blue, okay, it goes up and down. It went up high in the mid-90s, dropped down catastrophically at the end of the 90s, 
gone up a bit, went zigzag, and so on. It's actually the subsidy that accounts for about half of the income of farmers. The subsidy, do you want me to repeat that? Subsidy is accounting for about half of the income of farmers. Now, remember earlier on I said farming gets about 6% of the gross value added, about 9% of the total amount of money that's spent by consumers. Here's the latest National Audit Office report. There are lots of people I talk to who are getting interested in this, and the NAO is one. These are the official government uh, watchdogs. Those of you from the academics, you'll be interested in this one. Looking at different types of farming, poultry farming, dairy farming, general cropping, pigs, cereals, horticulture, and so on. Remove the subsidy, and some are really heavily hit. Cereals are, are, are smashed by removing the subsidy. So the, the orange is uh, average farm business income if you remove the subsidy. So they're very different impacts. The subsidies that I've given you here have a different impact on different people. So actually, horticulture is very little hit by the removal of EU subsidies. Why? Because it doesn't get any. The only subsidies for horticulture are basically for marketing. Very little for actually doing it. Uh, people like me are saying to the cabinet office, that needs to change. You've got to repump time in a massive way, horticulture. And this cuts across it all. This is a stunning set of uh, um, studies that came out at the very end of last year from Strutt and Parker, the land agents. Uh, uh, the plan is for subsidies to be maintained at EU levels for the next two years, possibly to the next five years, from 2026 to go down. If that happens, all British farming will see a collapse of profits by nearly 40%. This is why in the farming world, there are people talking about, well, land prices will collapse. Or maybe it won't because there'll be lots of Mr. Dysons buying it as long term. Money, land doesn't go away, money can. The profitability for the bottom 25% of farming will go down 50%. So small farmers, hill farmers like I was, wiped out. This is very serious indeed, okay. uh, because we're talking land use. Here is the Committee on Climate Change's land use figures. In my book, I use the much more uh, delicate Corian system. Uh, basically, here you can see last year, land use for England. This is for all the UK. Basically, mostly it's down to grass. Uh, sorry, grass here, uh, grass, rough grazing, forestry, the, only that amount for crop cropping. If we look at English uh, farming land use, cereals accounts for over half, and over about half of that is fed to animals. So basically, land use is dominated by things on four legs, occasionally two. And this is the... I apologize for this because it's very detailed. The group I was speaking to before this lecture, these are the figures I was telling you about, um, from the same data set, by the way. Total agricultural area in the UK is 18.7 million hectares. Croppable, in other words, what you could put a plough to or grow something on, other than just what's there, about six, so about a third of that. Within that, arable, about four and a half million. Horticulture is exactly 165,000 hectares. It's nothing. It's the sliver of a finger. So we've got lots of land, but we're not using it for the things that we know we've got to do. This is a very, very sober uh, verdict. Uh, you know, here it is in a different way. Total approximate cropping hectareage of Britain, fresh vegetables is 2.7% of the croppable land. We're not using our land. If Lord Walton was brought back, he wouldn't just want a supply map put above his desk. He'd want to know land use and how much is it doing for health. I said to you lot from here earlier, I'd put this up. These are the fruit imports and fruit exports. We basically import in very large amounts fruit, uh, and we export very little, actually. Uh, 
by value, we're getting it mostly from Spain, the Netherlands, uh, uh, as a total value from Spain, a little bit from South Africa, Netherlands. What does this mean? I'm beginning to know. I'm giving a very sober, and my book is extremely detailed about this. I think this is one of the big challenges you will ever have in your series. I can tell you many people who would give exactly the same talk. Uh, awareness of disruption to this, and the difficulties of this is rising. I'm not sure it's rising in politicians. Michael Gove gets it. Few other people in the cabinet get it. The opposition didn't get it. But there are a few people beginning to get it. Yet, for those of us who are watchers outside, the list of potential disruptions is considerable. Jonathan, who introduced me, is a specialist in this. You can cause great damage to a food system, not by dealing with the land or with the crop, but the people. You've just got to have an outbreak of coronavirus in the sandwich factory, and you're maximizing your vector. And this is beginning to be understood, the, the Yellow Hammer papers, the main thing that, that was holding it all back and is holding any public discussion. So I'm breaking ranks here, basically. Uh, the worry is about morale, stockpiling. But there's no stockpile to have. There isn't a stockpile. It's because it's on the motorway. The motorway is the stockpile, and it's exactly three days. But we've got this national food strategy which is due, if you don't know about it, if you are involved in it, you as Kiel should make sure that you've got a presence in that, if I may say so. The agricultural bill, number two, there was an agricultural bill. It was quietly dying before the election. A new one has been brought back, and people like me have been a little bit happier about it. It's still too agriculture-focused. I keep on writing rude letters to everyone who won't listen. Forget agriculture, it's horticulture. I'm joking, agriculture matters. Uh, but it is now, it's taken one of the ideas certainly I've championed, which is we need an annual food security review. I'm old, I shouldn't be having to do this talk to you. I shouldn't have to waste two years of my life writing a book I've just written and going and talking to people in secret as well as some not. It actually should be part of British public policy. And that's why I've come. So I, to, this is my last slide, I think. I think there's no single solution. It's a very sober story I'm giving you, but it's a very positive story. There's good news about health, good news about environmental systems, good news for birds and bees if we rethink land use and so on. But it's not going to happen by some technical fix. It, we need to have public engagement. We are not engaging enough with consumers. In fact, I'm coming back, not to here, but to Birmingham on Sunday. There's a very interesting process. Six select committees have unprecedentedly come together and are holding and hosting now a, cl a climate assembly. So 110 people have randomly been chosen across the, the whole of the UK and they're meeting for five weekends hold up in a hotel in Birmingham. And there are 50 experts, of which I'm one, coming to be grilled by them to try and say, what are we as the public going to do about tackling climate change? I think that's actually quite good, because basically we're going to have to behave differently. There's no conspiracy here. We've got to eat differently, use our land differently, behave differently, cook differently, shop differently. So it's not an easy, it's a multi-strategy, multi-level, multi-lever, multi-actor, multi-sector, multi-disciplinary. But what we're talking about is a realignment of production and consumption. That's actually the big message. We're going to have to retrain and reskill people in a better way. We're a country that deracinated itself from the land. We don't teach our kids to cook. We've had fights. I bet I'm the only person in this room who's got Jamie Oliver's personal numbers. You know, a good man, but it hasn't worked, actually. Uh, we've got to have more horticulture, less agriculture, more fruit and vegetables, less animal and dairy. 
So it's back to this, really. We've got a complex system, but we know a lot about it. The great thing Britain's got is got great scientists, great advisors, just deaf politicians, and a public which is actually not being consulted. So when you asked me to come and do this lecture, I thought, I'll come and talk, see what you think. And that's the front cover of my book. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>